their country fractured into parts. Some of the parts, some of the fracturing was easier in uh, countries like Slovenia, now a country. It was easier because it was relatively ethnically homogenous. But in some other parts of the former Yugoslavia, ethnic groups were intermingled in a sense, and there was a huge fight over territory and what would be the new component parts of any new countries created. And perhaps the worst of that fighting took place in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There are an estimated 100 to 200,000 people who died in those wars. That's a huge number, obviously. There are also an estimated 50,000 rapes that took place as part of the campaign of ethnic cleansing and the attacks on civilians. And one of the worst events of the war, but not the only terrible thing, there were prison camps, there were uh, detention centers, sell shelling of villages, etc., but was this massacre at Srebrenica. And one of the things that I think brought it so much to international attention was that it was a United Nations safe haven. Srebrenica is a town fairly close to the border of Serbia. It's located in Bosnia. And it was an area that was seen of tremendous strategic importance. There was a lot of fighting in the area. The United Nations, to protect the Muslim population there, had created what they called a safe haven by a Security Council resolution and had sent a Dutch battalion there to essentially hold that space for the civilians. As we heard this morning, the battalion was too small, um, the Serb army was too ferocious, and what happened in the summer of 1995 is as the Muslim defenders of the area withdrew, the United Nations peacekeepers really found themselves unable to meet um, the, the demands of the advancing Serb army. And in the afternoon, um, when General Mladic marched into Srebrenica and demanded the surrender, there was really very little they could do. And then I think you've heard through other speakers how the men were ultimately taken prisoner and killed for the most part, estimated six to 8,000 men and boys who were killed, and about 23,000 women were put onto buses with their children and younger men, and they were bust out of the area. The, um, the death toll is obviously shocking, but the deportations were equally shocking. And I think it's one of the reasons why we look at Srebrenica and we say this particular event, even though the conflict overall was horrific in scale and in the atrocities committed, this one atrocity does stand out. And of course, juridically, we'll explore with our panel of experts why it was so significant that it was labeled a genocide and what that means. So now I'm going to turn to my panelists. They've decided we should do this as kind of a question and answer, um, and we'll start each one off with a question. Everybody feel free to jump in. And Mark, maybe we could start with you, because you were there at the beginning. And um, you had suggested maybe we look at the Ardemovich case first, which wasn't really discussed very much this morning. It's an early case, 96 to 98. What was the significance of that case? How did it help? Um, help you and the prosecutor's office acquire the tools you needed to prosecute these cases, what kind of evidence, et cetera? Well, to answer that question, let me give you a little more background. In the hot summer days of July of 1995, the Bosnian Serbs decided to restrict the size of the enclave, which sat in the middle of territory that was coveted by the Bosnian Serbs. It was a festering sore. It had been a festering sore in their, their body, and they wanted to get rid of it. They initially started by trying to reduce the size, but by the 9th of July, opportunity, it dawned on them that there was no resistance, a little or no resistance. As a result of that, their military activity was to take over the enclave. That forced the population, probably 25 to 30,000 people, into a small village called Podichari. Different and separately, there was a column of men, 15,000 approximately, who tried to flee the enclave and make it up to Bosnian Muslim territory. Uh, that column started out during the takeover. It was interdicted and only a third of the column was able to get through into Bosnian uh, Muslim territory. 
uh, some of those members of the column were armed. Uh, the people who were caught behind the Serb lines were pulled out and lured out of the hills around Srebrenica by Bosnian Serb soldiers wearing, for example, UN helmets and UN gear. And as a result of uh, the collection of those men who were lured out of the hills, they were separated and they were put in fields. At the same time, men were being separated in Podachari as the women were being bussed out. The men were being separated and those two large groups of victims, ultimate victims, were then moved, were collected and then moved to uh, uh, distant parts of Bosnia, remote parts of Bosnia where the international eyes, the Dutch battalion, could not see what was happening to them and they were summarily executed over a series of days. Now since the events that were taking place in Srebrenica were being reported real time, the ICTY put investigators into Tuzla, as I recall, in very either late July or early August, and that's where the, the victims, the people who had been bust, were being brought into uh, an area where they could be taken care of. And that's where the remnants of the survivors of the column also located in Tuzla. We knew early on in the investigation that men had disappeared, and we were operating in a context of systematic denial by the Bosnian Serb authorities and the Bosnian Serb military. Nothing happened to the men. That's what was said to us repeatedly. So uh, ultimately, we, the picture emerged as survivors from these massacres started to straggle out into territory where they were free and safe. I think uh, my recollection is there were probably 14 survivors out of the seven to 8,000 people who were intentionally murdered. There were 14 survivors. And it soon became clear to us what had happened to the men. And we, but we, the investigative difficulty that we had was to determine where what we thought had happened to the men, they had been killed, where had the, those murders taken place since we had no eyes or ears in that part of the territory. Okay. Uh, as you know, the men were put on buses and they were taken oftentimes blindfolded. They were put in schools. They were far away from their homes and they couldn't describe to us where these murders took place. Now let's focus on Mr. Erdemovich to answer your question. Mr. Erdemovich was a young Bosnian Croat who was a soldier in a special forces unit of the Bosnian Serb army. On the 16th of July, Drajan Erdemovic participated in a systematic murder of 1,200 people at a place location called the Branjevo Military Farm. And bus after bus of prisoners defenseless Muslim men and boys were brought and summarily executed at, the, at this location. Those massacres took place for five hours. And at the end of those five hours, Erdemovich was asked to participate in additional murders at a nearby village called Pilica, uh, and he declined. He said essentially he'd had enough for, for the day, but some of his more eager and zealous mates participated. Erdemovich then went down to the village of Pilica and observed from across the street in a cafe, observed these murders. Now from the Branjevo military farm, there were probably two or three survivors who made it out into the free territory. From the Pilica cultural dome, there were no survivors. It was something that was not on our radar. So, now let's talk about Mr. Erdemovich and how he came to the attention of the ICTY. Erdemovich was not liked by his mates because he was a Bosnian Croat and he was distrusted. He had declined participating in additional executions and he was shot three times by his former colleagues, his fellow executioners, 
They attempted to kill him. They didn't succeed. And Erdemovich ultimately gave an interview in Belgrade to uh, a reporter who, who had recordings of the interview with Erdemovich as well as a map of the location. And when she tried to get through the airport, she was arrested and the tapes were confiscated and Erdemovich was also arrested. Now, in what is a little known, but I think a very significant uh, event, Judge Goldstone asked uh, the court to issue an order to the authorities in Belgrade to produce Mr. Erdemovich. And I, I have marveled over the years at the effect of that. They produced Mr. Erdemovich. Mr. Erdemovich came to The Hague and he was an insider who had particularly good knowledge about the murders, the location of the murders, who gave the orders, the chain of command, and uh, as a real insider, he was able to corroborate at least two of the survivors who said they had been executed at the Braniebo military farm. He uh, identified the location and then uh, we had to corroborate Mr. Erdemovich and we corroborated Mr. Erdemovich's evidence by the use of aerial images, the massacres Bronievo Military Farm took place on the 16th of July, 1995, and the U.S. government supplied us with an aerial image of the Bronievo Military Farm that took place on the 17th of July, one day later, and at that, lo that aerial image, you can see the bodies, you can see the excavation where the bodies are being uh, buried, and Erdemovich could identify that as the location, and he, it, was, it corroborated Mr. Erdemovich. Mr. Erdemovich also described to us the massacres at the Pilitsa Cultural Dome, which we had no idea had been committed. And an aerial image, again taken on the 17th of July, the day later, showed the trucks backing up into the Pilica Cultural Dome, and obviously they were there to remove the bodies. And, and subsequently, as a result of Mr. Erdemovich's cooperation, uh, we were able to get some traction in the investigation. Uh, we went to the Pilica Cultural Dome. John Rene Ruiz went to the Cultural Dome with a pair of, essentially, he found a pair of bolt cutters. The doors were locked. He cut open the, the doors to the cultural dome, and of course there was the, the grim remnants of a massacre. There were blood on the gr floor, shell casings, human tissue on the walls. I mean, it was a terrible sight. And uh, so M Mr. Erdemovich contributed significantly to us identifying another location. As I say, he identified perpetrators, he identified the chain of command for us, he testified in probably six or seven of the Shrebenitsa trials. And as a collateral benefit from Mr. Erdemovich, Mr. Erdemovich was uh, the person who engaged in the first plea agreement at the ICTY. Mr. Erdemovich, uh, as you know, when the tribunal started, or you may know, there was a resistance to plea bargaining. And I remember Judge Cassese had given a speech to the General Assembly, essentially saying there would be no plea agreements. Well, Mr. Erdemovich was, in my practice at the ICTY, one of the two people who was genuinely remorseful. He genuinely regretted that he had committed as many murders as he did. He had, by his own admission, depending on which statement you read, had committed between 10 and 100 of the 1,200 murders that took place at the Bronievo military farm. Uh, so he agreed to enter into a plea agreement. Uh, it was an oral agreement with me and, and the, his defense counsel. Eventually, he appealed the sentence, which was 10 years, 
It, the matter was reversed. I won't go into the reasons. And he then, the first written plea agreement was executed. Pete McCloskey prepared the written plea agreement. And as a result of that precedent, there were many other, I think there are probably 20 plea agreements at the ICTY. And if you understand that the, the benefit of a plea agreement as opposed to a six month or two year trial for each case, it saved considerable time for us. So, Mr. Erdemovich was a critical witness for us to start, and what was very, very important for us was it was a dispute publicly between the Serbian, Bosnian Serbian authorities and the Belgrade authorities saying nothing happened. And here, for the first time, was an insider who actually participated in these murders. The significance of that cannot be underestimated. Mm. And so Mr. Erdemovich is a, is a little footnote in the Srebrenica saga, but he's a very important footnote. And so that. Thank you, Mark. Say. There is quite a lot of story there that I didn't know, actually. Mm -hmm. Pat or Bill, do you have any comments on the Erdemovich case? Or? Well, no, I heard some of this before. So. <laughs> <laughs> Since I sat on the, on the trial, as you'll, as you'll find out. Yeah. But it's. Um, would you like, then, to turn to our second question, which is for you, Pat, which is moving forward in time, looking perhaps at the Kerstich case, which was referred to by Patty Vizer Sellers, the trial judgment in 2001 and the appeals judgment in 2004, which was the first case to convict for genocide. Um, do you want to talk maybe about that case and about its implications for jurisprudence going forward? Sure. Well, I should point out, as you probably have surmised, um, that Mark was the chief prosecutor in the first Kerstich case. And I was one of three judges. Uh, I will say, um, delving a little bit into the personal uh, aspect of it, despite the fact that you didn't ask the question, um, I was, had just gotten over the Hague. I'd been there about two months. Um, and the other two judges in what was known then as the French Chamber, and that's because a judge on the ICTY at the time, and still probably, I don't know, had either to be fluent enough in either French or English, which were the official languages. But the chamber I was put in was known as the French chamber because the other two judges, while they did speak English and perfectly polite, they preferred to speak French. So uh, before I got there, most of the uh, documents that came out of that chamber were in French, actually. Now, I had had two years of high school French <laughs> and a, a, a little public high school in northwestern Connecticut, which was, and I had a wonderful law clerk, went on to become an international uh, law professor out at Stanford, and she uh, actually signed up for, for, um, for lessons in downtown Hague because at one point they told me, and I'll get on to the question in a minute, but you want background. This is great. They, they told me that, well, they said, I said, I'm sorry, you know, I will do the best I can. If you're, if, when I get all these documents in French and stuff, we will do the best we can with either the translation, but the translation was slow. Mm -hmm. If you put in a document for translation in The Hague in those days, it could be three weeks, I don't know, maybe three months before. So we would puzzle over as best we could, she and I, to get that out. And that kind of bothered my colleagues a little, and they said, well, you know, we've been able to get these things out. I said, I'm doing the absolutely best thing we can. And they said, well, we previously had another judge in this chamber who only spoke English, but that judge always signed the documents anyway. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'm sorry, I just came from 20 years on the DC <laughs> circuit, and I don't sign any documents that I don't understand. Henceforth, not sure it's a good thing, but henceforth, all the stuff that came out of that chamber came out in English. <laughs> we were able to get, but this is just uh, to give you a little bit, I was absolutely, the other two judges had been on the Blastage case. They did have some uh, previous uh, uh, experience uh, there. But in terms of, the, this was the first case. After two months, we got the Srebrenica case, the 
Kerstich case. Uh, but I should point out to you that uh, we were, the trial took, the, we came out with a judgment 18 months later, which is really not bad considering the time lag, not just then, but subsequently in many cases. Also, during that entire time, we were also trying alternately the Omarska prison case, which mm -hmm. is also a major uh, ICTY case, which had five defendants who had run the Omarska and the AAA prison cases. So we would do a couple of weeks on one and then give those people a chance sort of to catch up with all the documentary stuff and we moved to the other. And so that was all done in this uh, two year time period on there. So um, it, it was a very interesting, needless to say, case. And for me, uh, just the experience of listening to the survivors, because as Mark knows, the initial parts of the case were primarily survivor testimony. And then there was that remarkable woman who had lost everybody in her family, her father, uh, her husband, uh, children, uh, so it was, it was an emotionally um, uh, sometimes devastating uh, case. I, I would like to just uh, address myself a little bit in light of Pat's uh, speech this morning about the evolution or the possible evolution of the kinds of genocide. Uh, and this is by no way of justification, even if it comes out that way, of the fact that our particular uh, finding of genocide, uh, the genocide part was limited to the men's part. But I have to tell you, I think we're all uh, children of our times. And to set the stage a little bit at that time, at that time, you, the only genocide convictions we had, uh, you can't count Nuremberg as genocide because right. genocide had not been invented. Also, I'll give you a footnote, when I was in law school, and I entered law school in 1948, and Raphael Lemkin was teaching a course there. He was the originator of genocide. I had no interest in it whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> this was for those guys in the third year who were gonna go out and teach. I was gonna be a labor law representing, labor lawyer representing unions. So I no, never, went, never went near any of that kind of thing. Um, but at this particular time, we did have, of course, Rwanda, some of those, but that was, a totally different situation. Rwanda, nobody denied there had been a genocide, and all you had to do was look at all of that publicity that had gone out ahead of time and all the calls to kill the, the, the uh, Tutsis, et cetera, so there really was no dispute. But the, the, the ICTY had never taken a genocide case through to trial before. I think that's correct. In fact, while I was there and during this whole period, there was the Jelicic case. Mm -hmm. Now Jelicic mm -hmm. was a head of some small, I don't remember, some small camp where prisoners were held. And he was obviously insanely, insane with the hate because he did Russian roulette with the Russian roulette with some of the prisoners. He called them cockroaches, said they ought to be wiped off the face of the earth. He was, you know, a real case sort of thing. But they're actually, they brought a genocide charge to him. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I get some of these facts wrong, Mark, but as I recall, <clears throat> the lower court, the trial court, char uh, dismissed the genocide case. But Correct. the prosecution, yeah. prosecution Appeal. appealed. Right. And I was designated, I was a trial judge, but I was designated to fill somebody who was recused place on the appeal court. When it came up to the appeal court, we all agreed, I think it's okay to talk about these things now, <clears throat> but we all agreed that there was enough evidence to withstand a motion to dismiss which comes at the middle of the trial after the prosecution's case. But a majority of the court said it was very clear they thought this was not, should not be the first genocide case at the ICTY that would go through, because this was a almost a nutcase, as it were, kind of thing. And this would not have the aura or the wrappings at the first genocide case. So they 
said we can because there's enough evidence that clearly he's going to be convicted on these other cases or even he'd admitted to some of them crimes against humanity we don't need the genocide so we're going to uphold the dismissal or simply not remand it because we don't want this to be the first genocide case that goes to the ICTY. Now, ironically, not ironically, Judge Shahabuddin and I dissented from that appellate ruling because at that point I was kind of a stick to the law person left over from my 20 years in the American courts. I didn't realize how creative you had to be in, <laughs> in the international courts. <laughs> so, so anyway, we just dissented, but that's the way it went. And so therefore, when Kerstich came up, that obviously uh, presented uh, a much better vehicle. But I will say, just in, in reference to uh, Pat's point this morning about our particular genocide ruling only covering the men's part, that in all honesty, and I'll get to this a little bit more in my speech for anybody that's left around that by tomorrow noon, <laughs> that um, it was a sort of miracle that we got the genocide <laughs> conviction. It was not an open and shut case to begin with because at this point, the only genocide convictions you had were basically the Rwandan case, which was, if anything, it was a parallel to the Holocaust on a, on a much, on a, on a, but it was a national case. There were guilty pleas in the Rwandan courts to that, and there really was no dispute that that was a real genocide. So the, the, the cases posed to us by the prosecution it was based upon what really was nov a novel genocide situation in those days, namely, you know, not that everybody in the whole group had been killed, but rather the men had been taken off and killed, the women had been separated and bussed off to uh, Tuzla uh, with the children. And in fact, that was one of the main defenses, if I recall, Mark, was that this can't be a genocide because look, first of all, you didn't kill everybody, so that doesn't mean that those you know women couldn't go and set up new families, et cetera, and that sort of thing. And uh, you know, uh, and apart from that, another reason is if you looked at all of the other villages that the Serbs had taken over. In no other ones of the villages had they killed the people. They might have imprisoned them in the Serb camps. They might have done bad things to them, but in no other case. So how can you say that they had genocidal intent? This is the only situation where uh, they actually killed the people. That went to whether or not this really was a legitimate, quote, group under the uh, genocide. But this was the situation, novel situation, put up to us by the prosecution. You know, I, I suppose it's conceivable that if we were really uh, brilliant people, we could have thought of the other uh, side of the allegations. We did have testimony about some of the uh, terrible things that happened to women, I think, sometimes initially in the first couple of days in Podakari, but it, there's, those were all, as he pointed out, crimes against humanity. But uh, whether or not you know, we went as far as we could have gone, I think that, uh, so we'll go into a little bit more later, I think that you know, it was a significant first step in what I'll say unloosing the notion of genocide from its paradigmatic background, which would have been the way the Holocaust was perceived, even though you didn't have an actual genocide crime then, or the Rwandan situation into uh, a more sort of flexible uh, atmosphere which would be governed by you know the practical realities of real life. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Bill, maybe that leads to, you had pointed out this led to the dichotomy with respect to Srebrenica being considered a genocide but not some of the other atrocities. Do you want to speak to that and then maybe speak to the Popovich case and the recent cases, Tolomir? How is the narrative about genocide um, being shaped? Sure, thank you. I learned a lot from hearing these personal accounts. 
uh, this, this afternoon. And um, let, let me make a start with an observation uh, that uh, when the Yugoslavia Tribunal was set up, am I speaking loud enough for the people at the back? Yeah. When it was set up by the Security Council in uh, 1993, the lawyers who drafted the statute looked back to the, essentially to the law as it stood in the 1940s, starting with the charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal, which was authored by Robert Jackson. Um, and then they added to it, uh, the, the, basically to the core that came from the Nuremberg trial, the definition of genocide, and they added as well the grave breach provisions of the Geneva Conventions. But I think that if they had left it at the Nuremberg package, I don't think the result would have been very different at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, frankly. The same people would be in jail for the same acts. Yeah and they would have received sentences for the same right. length of time because the sentences, there's no hierarchy in the crimes as the, has been held over and over again by the, by the judges at the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the horror of these acts, whether they're described as genocide or as crimes against humanity, wouldn't, I don't think, have had any great change in terms of the sentencing. So the same people would be in jail, the same trials would have taken place we might be done. Serge might be looking for a new job. Maybe he already is, but you know, he might be, he, he would be that much more advanced probably in finishing it. Um, so the, 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 the question is, of course, the, the value added mainly from a legal standpoint, uh, and I guess in terms of the, uh, the way the victims view the, the results of the tribunal uh, by, by adding this qualification of, of genocide. Um, and I think in the first trial, the one that, that Pat referred to of Yelisic, he actually came to the tribunal with a guilty plea. Mm -hmm. And he said, I plead guilty to crimes against humanity. Yeah, and it was then Louise Arbour, who was the prosecutor, who said, I think we're going to try this one. If you won't plead guilty to, to genocide as well, then we'll have a trial of that. And uh, I think that probably created some of the frustration in the judges of the trial chamber as well, that they were going through a bit of an exercise in a case, that, as you've described, of a, of a man who was not playing with a full deck, as we say. Yeah. Didn't you know? appear from the record. No, <laughs> no. And finally, that's why he wasn't convicted in the trial judgment, Yelisic, of genocide, because they said that he didn't have the mental capacity, more or less, to, to do it. I think one of the things I always thought was charming about Yelisic was he'd adopted this nom de guerre of Adolf. He Adolf, called himself right. the Serbian yes. Adolf. Do you remember that? Yes. yes. And, uh, you, you know... Does anybody know anyone named Adolf today? I mean, it's, a na it's, it's sort of gone out of fashion as a name. There's you know? a meat tenderizer called Adolf. Is there? Adolf's meat tenderizer. Well, that's been around for a long time, I think. Um, and I, I'm very uh, glad to hear Pat describing the Kersich judgment in 2001, which came a year after the Yelisich decision, or a year and a half after, uh, as being novel, because it is a novel interpretation. It's not, it wasn't obvious. Uh, at that point, because the only judgments we had were the, a few Rwanda tribunal judgments, which were clearly, um, nobody's really argued about the genocide. The Rwanda jurisprudence, the Rwanda tribunal jurisprudence on, juris, on genocide, I've always found to be of, of lesser interest, actually, uh, as a general proposition, simply because the difficult issues about defining genocide were, were never really debated. They were never really controversial whereas in the Yugoslavia tribunal it was a different matter. So that the, the judgment in Kerstich, and then it was, your judgment was partly overturned. Only, only on the aspect of his liability. Yeah, exactly. So the, the core of it, of using the word genocide right. to describe the massacre, right. Right. Was never, has never been altered since your finding. But Kerstich's own personal responsibility was, again, I've never been a judge or sat in the, in the room with the judges, but that appeals chamber decision to me always smelled of a compromise among judges um, because it's a sort of a strange result. And I, knowing some of the judges who were in on it, many of us know them, <laughs> Maron, Pokar, Schomburg, I think they must have been horse trading there and one of them saying, I'm going to dissent, and then the other two saying, okay, We'll convict them of aiding and abetting. Could you sign on to that? And they must have said, deal. I'm speculating. 
I don't know that. Let me add one thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the appeals chamber. Yeah. They, uh, I just found, well, I'll get to that. Point. But one thing I, you might be interested to know and other people is, oh, I'm sorry. One thing you might be interested, do you talked about, and I think I largely agree with you, that those same people would have been found guilty of crimes against humanity and spent time in jail. But there was, there, we discussed the, the, the sentence in the... Uh, I know I, that, that, that you hit, you resonated. A well, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, we discussed, we discussed, the judges discussed the sentence once it was agreed upon. First of all, I'll tell you as I was going to, say tomorrow too. We did have debate within the trial court as to whether or not we would call it genocide. We, we had an active, active debate on that, just along the lines, you know, that, that anybody else. But eventually, we did have unanimity on that. I mean, it was a perfectly open discussion between us. We went back and we eventually um, said yes. But when it came time for sentencing, here was the way the discussion went a little bit. Okay, we only have, we, there's no death penalty you know, in, in this court, so the most you could give is a life sentence, and nobody at that point had ever given a life sentence. And so the point that one of the judges made very strongly, and it probably ended up carrying the day to some degree, was we can't give him the highest that we can give anybody because Milosevic and, and Kerstich uh, and Karadich and those big guys are still out there. So and there's got to be some place that's the highest for them. So we actually gave him a sentence which for him was a life sentence. It was 46 years. Uh, and he was a gentleman with already one leg amputated and uh, in his 50s, I guess. Anyway, so, you know, basically that was a life sentence. And we would save this, some category up there for these people who were outstanding. Of course, Kerstich is still alive and in a Polish jail today. But so there was, you know, there was a little bit of effect of genocide on the actual sentencing. I'm so pleased to hear you say that, because for years <laughs> I've lectured to my students when they say, where did they get that number, 46 years? Yes. Was it 40, 45, 46? 46. 46. 46. Where did they get that? For, it was turned on, on appeal. It got reduced. Yes, it got reduced Where did 35. they get the 46 from? And I said, because they're saving 47 for Milosevic. Uh, but I was just <laughs> speculating about what judges were thinking. I had no insider knowledge. No. Can I, I just say a word yes, about Yes, and I think Mark okay. wants to Mark, sorry. Yeah. Let, let yeah. me just and make then. an observation, because one of the, one of the difficult issues was what sentence is appropriate for genocide. And when you intentionally and premeditatedly murder 8,000 people, what is an appropriate sentence? I mean, if you do a comparison to the United States, where yeah. I'm not saying the United States is, the, is, the, is a, a system that is perfect, it's not, yeah. <laughs> not even close. But a single death can result in the death penalty or a life without possibility of parole. And in the international system, a life sentence is not truth in advertising. If you give somebody a life sentence in Europe, in my understanding was that a life sentence in Europe is 20 years. And therefore, if you behave properly in a prison in Europe and you don't cause problems, you get good behavior and work time credits and brush your teeth every day and make your bed, you get a, a reduction in your sentence. So I was faced, and we were, Andrew was part of the prosecution team, by the way, Andrew Cayley. We were faced with the issue of what's the appropriate sentence. And so we, I did a, a, a simple calculation. I took a third off of a 20-year sentence and divided the number of days by 8,000 people. And then I took a 20-year sentence and did the same thing. And I recall my figures were less than two days for each premeditated murder. Now, part, in my view, somebody who kills 8,000 people uh, should not be permitted, uh, should not have a 13-year a, a, a sentence or a 15-year sentence. So I then asked 
made a submission to the court for consecutive life sentences, which means that uh, for each crime for which Kerstich had been committed, he would serve a life sentence, which would be 20 years with a reduction, and then for the next sentence, he would serve the next 20 year sentence and so on. And I, I will tell you, Judge Wald, that uh, I was delighted with the sentence. And I, I think I was asked by the press to say, let's not quibble with, with this sentence. But I then subsequently went to Shrebenica and Jean-René Ruiz and, uh, and I participated in a conference in Shrebenica and the mothers of Shrebenica were present. I saw that in the press. Yeah. They, they talked. And they were, they were, they were we, mad. and you know, the mothers of Shrebenica, God bless them, they were a, a, an interest group who found a meaning in life to uh, never forget what had happened to their families and keep it in the public eye. And I'm friends with the mothers of Shrebenica, but we have our disputes and we have our debates. And I sat at lunch with the mothers sitting across from me. And I was pilloried by the fact that there was no life sentence. And that carries a lot of meaning with, with yeah. the victims, the victim community. And I engaged them in a discussion with what the reality was that he, that uh, the sentence that he had been meted out was, was essentially a life right. sentence. And they got it and they appreciated it. But sentencing is, it's an in, it's an, question for which uh, on crimes of this magnitude, there is no rational answer. What's the, what's the proper sentence? I've, I've always assumed, Bill, that the reason, I don't know this, the reason the appeals court reduced it was when they reduced it from a perpetrator of yeah. genocide to aiding and abetting, they felt they had to go down. Right. So I think if you look at it, where they differed with us and where I differ with them and still do, um, is their notion that he was not a perpetrator, but because, because, and this gets to the, this gets to what remains for me the critical unanswered question in all the uh, Srebrenica. I haven't read the latest, a uh, couple of latest cases, so I can't include them where the perpetrate, where they were convicted as perpetrators, but was this theme that went through a lot of the later Srebrenica, and they, they referred in the appellate court to Kerstage as, you know, a man who was, I don't have, remember the exact words, but was caught up in his surroundings, caught up by the evil in his surroundings. So the, the question became, if you could show, you know, how much you could infer from the fact which they admitted and everybody knew, and we certainly had made findings, that Kerstage was aware at the latter stages that there was a, these killings of the prisoners going on. He was aware of that. He did, in fact, uh, enable part of them by allowing the deployment of some of his uh, Adrena Corps troops to go in there. There was no evidence, there wasn't much evidence in that particular case, though I found it interesting. In some of the later cases, more things would come out about mm -hmm. him, but those were later cases. Uh, but he was not found like Jelisic. He didn't scream and yell and say they are cockroaches and so we want them off the face of the earth. There was no evidence. He was a kind of a disciplined, dramatic type um, uh, guy who sat there. But the question that despite the fact that there was knowledge, uh, that it was going on, and then there was support uh, in light of that knowledge, but that he wasn't carrying on uh, like some of the Rwandan defendants, that therefore they did not think it was proper for us to have inferred an intent of genocide. I found that theme coming up again and again in later Srebrenica uh, cases about how much you could infer from knowledge and support, or you had to, I couldn't quite understand in some of the cases, there seemed to be some notion there had to be something beyond there, some, some evidence of somebody like the uh, German Nazis writing down about these people have to be wiped off the face of the earth, which I think is, at least in my view, is, should not be uh, a necessity.
Yes. Anyway. Well, now, if you, if you want to talk about the sentences <laughs> that appear to be on the low end, uh, the Adamovich one is a good starting point. Uh, he confesses to participating in a genocide right. and to killing somewhere between 10 and 100 people, and he gets five years. The prosecutor asked for 10, and the defense asked for seven, and he got five. I mean, how good is that, you know, for, uh, for uh, 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 you know, uh, there, I think all of this shows, actually, and, you know, some of our thunder today was stolen by Patty's fantastic presentation this morning where she went through the subsequent cases, uh, admittedly from her particular yeah. perspective. Yeah. But to me, what, what remains from all of these cases now is actually a confused picture of the case law. It's a confused picture, yeah. and it shows that there's a lack. If we, if we could get 15 of the judges uh, who have sat in these cases here around the table and asked them what they Why think about it, it, we'd hear 15 different takes on it, I think. There's a lack of clarity. Where there's some clarity on it, and this is, the, this is a judgment that, that actually nobody's mentioned, but it's a very important piece of it. It's the judgment from the other tribunal in The Hague, the International Court of Justice. Oh, yes, yes. Because in February of 2007, the International Court of Justice issued its ruling on the Bosnian application that also identified this dichotomy, the genocide in Srebrenica, but in the municipalities right. and the rest of the conflict, no finding of genocide. And when they did that, it was controversial. They pointed to the, the judgments, which had their which confirmed this view, but also the conduct of the prosecutor. They looked, and this was this bothered enormously the, 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 the uh, applicants in the International Court of Justice case, and they were criticized for it, but they said, the prosecutor doesn't always charge genocide in these mm -hmm. cases, doesn't do it systematically, didn't do it for Ardemovich, for example, but he's hardly alone. In the Popovich case, I think three of the seven were charged with genocide, is that right, Serge? So th they weren't all, they were all there, but they weren't all charged with genocide. So it leaves an uncertainty, and then these judgments have a kind of a confused picture. So that what, what remains from it, if we're, if we're looking at the legacy of it, we have this core finding from, from yourself, from the Kursich trial chamber decision, confirmed by the International Court of Justice, right. But everything else around yes, it, yes. this point about, because it's true, it's the, it's the smallest number, seven to 8,000 people, it, it's in a different order of magnitude than the Rwandan genocide, the Nazi genocide, the Armenian genocide. It is a novel approach, and now the question is, if, that's, if it can go down to seven or 8,000, how low? What's, what's the bottom line there? And as, as Prosecutor Bramertz explained this morning, there's a little test on that, again. I think my own view, of, there's a test now in the, in the Mladic case with the new evidence that they introduced. I'm uneasy about that only because I think that we've got to a point where at least we have a, it may lack coherence, the idea that there's a genocidal event at Srebrenica but the rest of the war is not genocidal, but we've got now two judgments of the International Court of Justice that more or less confirm that consistent case law. and I'm. I'm just nervous that the appeals chamber of the Yugoslavia tribunal, that there are going to be some judges there who want to sort of go down in history as having the last word and they're going to upset everything. And all that's going to leave us with actually is an even more confused and incoherent message about it all. This came up in the, the second genocide case at the International Court of Justice. because That case was Croatia and Serbia. And Croatia in particular came to the court and said, if you look at the at the, at the Kerstich case, uh, that's 7,000. So we don't have that. We don't have 7,000 killings, but we have the Vukovar Hospital, which was, yeah. what, 150, 200? I don't remember exactly the numbers. A couple of hundred, Serge? 200. So not the 400 of your mass grave, but it's in that order of magnitude. And they said, so have another look at it. Although the judgments on the Vukovar Hospital, which was, uh, this was a case in Croatia. This was in Eastern Slavonia the Vukovar Hospital, and it, it involved a, a much lower number, and uh, that was never even charged by the prosecutor as genocide. Uh, and, 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 and so the, the International Court of Justice said, no, we're not going to rule on that, and of course it dismissed both the claims by Serbia and by, by Croatia. But, um, so I, I, I mean, and I'd be prepared, I'd bet not a huge amount of money, but I'd wager with Serge on that he won't get the genocide charge for the 400, but who knows? And this, 
all of us have been surprised in recent years by some of the developments at the appeals chamber. <laughs> Am I understating so, things? Yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, Mark, why don't you just finish this round with the jurisprudence and moving to Mladic and Karadic and this issue of genocide, and then we're going to turn to politics, and then we'll turn to you, the audience. I'm already getting the high sign. We go till 4 o'clock, is that right? Four. Okay, so we have time. All right. So, very quickly, just to round it off, Karadic, Mladic. Okay. Let me expect? let me just state a disclaimer. I have been out of the ICTY since 2010, and the Karadic and Mladic trials started after I left. So, but from what I do know is the uh, pull the mic closer. In a related case, the Krajishnik case, Krajishnik was charged with genocide. And the court, and he was charged with genocide that occurred well prior to Srebrenica. He was charged with genocide that took place in 1992 during the ethnic cleansing campaign that took place in the municipalities all throughout Bosnia. And the court held that the actus reus of genocide had been established, but the mens rea had not been established. Uh, in the Mladic and Karadic cases, it's my understanding that they are reasserting that genocide took place in the municipalities in 1992, and they have uh, evidence, new evidence, to demonstrate that and new arguments. I'm not going to elucidate on either of those because I'm somewhat ignorant on they are making an attempt to, to establish that genocide took place in Bosnia in 1992. And maybe we'll come back to Serge when we get into our Q&A. Of course, the General Assembly did, um, did adopt a resolution calling the ethnic cleansing genocide uh, early on, but that well, it was... Called, it said ethnic cleansing was genocide. It said it ethnic cleansing was genocide. It didn't say that ethnic That's cleansing exactly in right. former Yugoslavia mm -hmm. was genocide. I think just no, before you move on, just one, yeah. I think Bill has made a good point about one area that's still not clear enough, uh, and that's, you know, what are the minimal uh, kinds of uh, scope of it, how small could you get it? A bunch of, the, a bunch of a, that was a defined group, it, well, that would again be how you define a group, but if they were leaders or something, we're sitting in a room, and you threw a bomb into that room. You know, is is that a genocide? But the one area, other area, which I'll also get to tomorrow, that I have is, I think, has been confused. Hopefully, the last couple of perpetrator convictions may have cleared it up. I haven't read them, uh, and that is, you know, the business of what it takes to show genocidal intent over and above knowledge and uh, substantial action. And I think the whole business we went through, which I'll go through again, of when it isn't a perpetrator, then it becomes a uh, aider and a better. Uh, that particular definition carried over from domestic law into this particular area where you're talking in, in Srebrenica's case, uh, and these are all Srebrenica cases, uh, you're talking about thousands of people. It's not like the guy who's carrying, uh, you know, who's driving the car from the robbery or that sort of thing, and turns out to be neater or better, but they just, I thought the appellate court just took these domestic uh, principles, as it were, and just without thinking about the different context. I'm not original on this. I think uh, David Schiffer has written an article along these lines. Other people have too, probably. And just lifted it wholesale into a international you know, massacre area without kind of thinking about delineations, I thought. And then when you added the specific direction business to that, to even the aiding and abetting, I thought you ended up with, in my view, a mess. Now that, I think the court is beginning to clear out now from the later, from what I understand in the latest decisions, they've kind of gotten rid of the specific direction, or at least the majority of them have, and maybe clarified uh, something, but I thought, that for a while there it was very difficult to figure out. 
It, if you'll permit me, maybe just a word of explanation, especially for the non-specialists. So part of what we're talking about here is genocide has these constituent elements. You have to show a genocidal act. That's what Patty was talking about. You have to show that it was committed with criminal intent. And so we're fighting about really what kind of criminal intent and what kind of evidence do you have to show. And genocide requires this specific intent to destroy. Of course, specific intent in different jurisdictions can be interpreted differently. And so the question is, how does it play out? And then just to make things really messy, they have all these different ways you can commit the crime. You can order it. You can be a superior. You can be an aider and a better. And the jurisprudence at the ad hoc tribunals has different modes of liability than we'll see at the internet. National Criminal Court. So we're going to keep having complicated um, questions of, of law uh, with respect to the commission of these crimes. I might turn it now to some of the political issues that we yeah. talked about. One, one um, last thing, though. One last just, thing. Just okay. one last point, a court point. As long as the International Court, certainly the ICTY, I think I'm right, operates on the notion that, you know, one that while the trial judges may be uh, governed by what the appellate judges say, you can have one appellate panel come down with a decision as happened in specific directions. Six months later, or seven months later, a different panel comes down with a different one. And for a while, if I were a trial judge, I would be very, and I think some of the trial judges were, I'm told, somewhat confused. Some would be following one, some might be following another. As opposed, I don't say our system is so great, but uh, our federal system, at least, once the Court of Appeals comes down with one decision, that's it. I mean, you would have to get an embank, or you would have to specifically get rid of it. You couldn't just have another panel come down with a different decision and then leave it all sort of out there. But that's a structural comment. And, uh, and unlikely to get fixed at the ICC, so, or at the ICTY anytime soon. All right, let's move on to some of the contextual or political issues. Um, Bill raised a really uh, interesting one, is that the ICTY case law establishes in essentially the facts of what happened in Srebrenica. There was an apology that was forthcoming from the Serbian president in 2013, although he didn't refer to it as a genocide. Uh, and recently, there's been a lot of pushback on whether or not this was a genocide from different political constituencies. Recently, there was a big controversy in the Security Council. Bill, maybe you want to speak to that. Yes, well, there uh, was an attempt in, uh, in uh, July, of, I think a week or two before the anniversary of the massacre, to get a resolution in the United Nations Security Council of commemoration for the Srebrenica genocide. And uh, it was not successful, it was not adopted. Um, it was proposed by the United Kingdom. Uh, it was vetoed by, this, by, by Russia, although uh, there were, I think, five other abstentions among the members of the Security Council. So it's indicating it's not just a question of Russia against for some perverse reason against the rest of the world, but they, they barely had enough votes to adopt the resolution. Uh, they had just enough to get it adopted, a bare majority, which is why then Russia vetoed it. I think if there had been one more abstention, abstentions would have been a good, good enough because you need to have nine votes in the Security Council to adopt the resolution. The transcript of the debates, which is readily available, it reads like something that was out of the Cold War, actually. Um, it's very, it's quite tragic because the result of the feuding between the British and the Americans, about the big time, Samantha Power was leading the, the debate, obviously, and the, the result is there's no resolution. And it, it is a case where they ought to have been able to find some way of reaching a common narrative sufficiently acceptable that they could adopt it. And the result then is, you know, it's on both sides, scoring points, they think, uh, and not a lot of thought being given to the victims of mm -hmm. Srebrenica, who are the ones who are really entitled to have it commemorated in, in such a way. Uh, it reminds me of, a, of another resolution, not in the Security Council, but in the General Assembly. They're very rare, actually, resolutions in either the Security Council or the General Assembly making a determination about something being genocide. And of course, they weren't actually 
doing it in this, this resolution in July because they just refer to the judgment of the International Court of Justice saying it's already been legally determined. The, the Russian objections, by the way, are not just about the word genocide, but they're about a number of issues. But 30 years ago, there was a debate in the General Assembly, quite similar in many respects, when the Soviet Union and some of its allies proposed a resolution following the massacre in Srebrenica in, in Sabra and Shatila. In, in outside Beirut, in the suburb of Beirut, a Palestinian refugee camp where uh, Lebanese militias, but with incited by you know who, went in and uh, massacred, I forget the numbers, and there was a resolution proposing it as genocide. And the same countries that insisted on it being genocide at Srebrenica in the Security Council this time uh, rejected the paragraph in the resolution calling it genocide. And, at Sabra and Shatila. Um, so this is the political debate about it. I wonder whether there would have been, I mean, part of, the, part of the problem in the Security Council, if they had just declined to get into the qualification of it, would that have done it? There's also the sense that by uh, focusing exclusively on, a, on, a, on a, a massacre, atrocious as it is, and it does stand out of all of the horrible events in the wars in, in, in the former Yugoslavia as the worst single event, I think, by far. But nevertheless, by focusing on that, um, it fails to acknowledge that there were victims on other, on other parts. I mean, one of the, the tragedies now of the legal legacy of, the, of dealing with the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia is that one of the great episodes of ethnic cleansing, a terribly brutal episode which took place after the Srebrenica massacre, I'm speaking of Operation Storm, mm. has essentially gone unpunished. It was, there was an attempt to prosecute it. The prosecutor was very successful in the, at the trial. Three, three judges unanimously condemned the, uh, the, the uh, Operation Storm as being not only war crimes but crimes against humanity, this, this final episode of ethnic cleansing. But it was reversed now by the appeals chamber with, with two very um, shrill defenses, uh, 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 dissident, dis dissenting opinions. But nevertheless, the result is that actually that, that's a big, that's a gap in, in, the, in the legacy as well of the, of the tribunal in that that part of it has gone, has gone unpunished. But, so that's part of the debate as well about memorializing things and getting the memorialization Right. I mean, we, we talk now, we look back at Nuremberg and the Second World War and the great critiques of the one-sided nature of that prosecution. We don't deal with things like the, it didn't deal with the Katyn massacre, or rather it dealt with it, but in, an, in a not an appropriate way. And there were other things. I mean, if we talk about destroying a city, men, women, and children, by dropping a bomb on it, we had a 70th anniversary earlier this month. Mm -hmm of two cities that were just destroyed, and nobody's been called to account for that either. Well, on that sober note, Mark, did you want to jump in, or Pat, on the, the politics? I think then, I had um, actually a question on the gendered nature of the genocide, but Patty, these are sellers, uh, in a sense, spoke to that this morning. What I might do, um, because the prosecutor Bramertz and Michelle Jarvis from the tribunal have also penned a, um, an, a piece in the news on the same point. What might be interesting, though, Pat, if you wouldn't mind speaking to um, in your time at the ICTY, did you observe the way that crimes affected women and girls in particular, and what lessons do you think maybe the ICC could draw from that, from the successes and challenges um, of the ICTY in that regard? Well, I can tell you mostly about what I remember. I'm not sure what lessons I can uh, draw. Actually, there was, during the period that I was there, a, an awareness about uh, crimes against women. I did hear some complaints from some women, excuse me, who were in the prosecutor's office, that they felt that uh, when the prosecutor's office was doing an investigation of a particular incident, uh, et cetera, that because so many of the investigators out there would be male, and that they, when they were going out into the field and talking to people in their own language, et cetera, that they wouldn't be as aware of looking for 
for it. I'd say these are the complaints. I was in no position to, to evaluate them. That they wouldn't be as aware of possible women's um, crimes that have been committed. They wouldn't be looking for them the way they might be looking for some of the men. On the other hand, while I was there, they had the first, um, remember, um, Peggy Coe and the, what was, which case was it? Was all women? Fortune. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, yes, yeah, yeah, it was all, all women, ask. yeah, all women crimes. And uh, I know that the, the alternate case that I had with Srebrenica over that first year was the Omarska uh, prison camps. We had a parade of, of, of witnesses, of women witnesses who had suffered uh, sexual abuses, and we did make findings of those in terms of, there was no genocide charge in this particular, in terms of crimes against humanity and in terms of, uh, of war crimes, crimes against humanity, a whole list of them. I will just, again, just give you one, one thing that stuck with me because we had a whole parade and it was very interesting because we had five defendants who had been either the officials in Omarska or the next level down. And some of the women witnesses would go by, and occasionally one of the one or two of the male defendants, they were all male defendants, would um, yell out this um, nasty, uh, nasty uh, word at her, but of course it would be in a Serb Serbian Croatian dialect. And the whole courtroom would serve the ones who understood it would stand up and object, and then there would be a huge thing about, no, that's not what he said, that's not what that word means. Here you had three judges from Portugal, Egypt, and the United States that <laughs> didn't have a clue as to you know, what had been said. You would have to designate the translator who was present in all of these particular cases. The translator would become the ultimate authority on whether an insult had, of, of uh, proportions had been been brought out. But I think, you know, we were certainly aware. The one thing I remember most which really hit me at home was some of these women had been sent between the, there were three camps, uh, Omarska, Tripoli, and Karnica. Anyway, yes, yes, okay. And sometimes these women would be, you know, transferred from camp to camp. And I remember one of the women had been through three camps and been raped and assaulted so many times. The problem you had was you had a particular defendant in the box. And, you know, that under the laws of, you know, that we're all accustomed to, you have to have, you know, proof beyond a reasonable doubt that a particular defendant committed a particular crime. In this case, this woman, you know, had been raped so many times when she had to undergo any kind of cross-examination by the defense counsel about the particulars, the night when this defendant attacked you, what room was it, uh, who was there, how did it happen? Of course, she you know, was confused. It left me with that feeling, which I got sometimes during these proceedings, but I also get it during American court proceedings. You know, that somehow the court system and all of our particular rules which are necessary for the defendant in criminal procedures, but they sometimes miss the whole thing mm -hmm. because this is a woman who had been assaulted dozens of times and yet <clears throat> there was no way in this particular case you had, could get anywhere near the modicum of uh, proof. Mm. Yeah. All right, now for our audience, it's up to you to ask our panelists questions. I have a few in my back pocket if there are no questions, but I suspect there will be. I think, Serge, you wanted to um, intervene quickly. Is there a microphone? Because, you know, is somebody running a mic? I don't uh, Well, just, we'll have uh, right here. So yeah. Only, uh, of course, there are uh, many Speak up. There are many potential comments to, to, to make on genocide and the, uh, the quality of judges, etc., etc. But the, the comment I wanted to make is in relation to the 45 years sentence. Okay. Uh, because, uh, um, you know, when I, when I arrived at the tribunal uh, as a European prosecutor, I was much more impressed by the 45 years sentence than by the life sentences because in Belgium, 
life sentence is, is automatically changed into 20 years, and you, uh, you stay an average of 40 years in prison if you are getting a life sentence. And the point I want to make is that recently there were the first requests for early release for persons convicted life sentence. And the question was, uh, how are we calculating two-thirds of the life sentence? Uh, uh, another debate could be, you know, we have this early release, which in fact is much more hardened, because everybody is automatically released after two-thirds, which personally I also find very, very strange and not very, very much in favor, because in the national system, you have conditional early release, but uh, you have a certain follow-up. We have our accused are all leaving after two thirds, and they can make whatever, whatever comment up. But the point I want to make is that to calculate what is two thirds of life sentence, yeah. the judges have said, well, let's look at the highest sentence which has been pronounced, which is 45 years, and let's calculate two thirds of the 45 years, which means that early release for a life sentence is only intervene, intervene mm -hmm. after 30 years where if you have only applied the national legislation from the country where the, where the, uh, the prison sentence is served, it would have been much earlier. In this sense, yeah. interestingly, the decision of 45 years has a huge impact on the duration of serving of life sentences for all the other people, uh, which I think is a we were, we were so naive, we just thought we were giving 45 <laughs> years. We didn't have the early release thing in our minds or anything else. That's so interesting. The rest of us, if people who talk for a long time, would please get up and use the microphone. Sure. Sure. Well, let me just repeat that quickly, if I got it right. Prosecutor Bramowitz was saying that the four, because you base the early release, having a term of years of 46, year, 46 years rather than just life, meant that the early release would be 30 years, which is fairly significant, rather than a much lower uh, number of years. Is that right, Serge? Yes, but it also was used to calculate right. I see that. of a life sentence. Yeah. Right. It was used to calculate what is two thirds of a life sentence. And then they looked at what is the maximum sentence ever given, which uh, is this one. And they looked at the maximum sentence, which is the 46 years actually given in the Kerstich case by the trial chamber. Um, uh, gentlemen over here, please just state your name and your affiliation and your question. Okay, and Mark may have some too, but I can remember in the very beginning, and pick me up if I don't get the sequence right, but in the very beginning, um, there was a, a, a defense. I, can't, I, don't think, I don't think the Kursish def, Defense Council carried it too far, but that these killings were done in combat, not, not outside. They were, these were soldiers, and so it was mm -hmm. part of war. Uh, kind of thing. Then, of course, there was these forensic people that you brought in, the prosecutor brought in from all over who had un unearthed the uh, bodies with parts of bodies in remote locations, and they had blindfolds on, and they, their hands had been tied before, and the bullets had been in the back of their head, which, of course, thoroughly demolished. So this trial went on for 18 months, and there'd be, you know, a raising sometimes of a defense then there'd, you know, there'd be a, a good answer to the defense, or sometimes because the prosecution came on first, they would see that there was no point in raising the defense when you had these experts from all over the world who'd unearthed all of the uh, bodies, that that would no longer be a very good uh, defense. So actually, I thought that my own feeling is the Kerstich defenders, who are both uh, from uh, Bos they were um, 
Bosnian Serbs uh, were very responsible yeah. in that case. They did not do any antics, as I read about in, in some of the other cases. Uh, so we didn't, even when Kerstich got on the stand himself, uh, he, you know, he kind of, uh, uh, he denied uh, sometimes uh, some, some things which were, to a judge, undeniable. For instance, we had a lot of evidence in Kerstich uh, that were wire, uh, the equivalent of wiretaps, the, bos the intercepts. Inter intercepts that are out in the field. And they were very elementary. I mean, these guys would come in. It amazed me, you know, after coming from the, you know, U.S. fancy criminal trials, they would have these notebooks, which were like the Mickey Mouse notebooks your kid carries to school, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got Mickey Mouse on the cover kind of thing. And they had taken down all of these notes from the intercepts. And so the question of denial uh, of the intercepts, it was pretty hard for the defense. You'd have one after the other, after the other, after the other. It was virtually impossible for them to, or they would. If they had tried to manufacture that evidence, they could have done it in so much more of a sophisticated <laughs> way than the Mickey Mouse notebooks that it really convinced me that it was probably pretty genuine. But there were, you know, attempts to, uh, I have to say, as the prosecution, I thought you know, mounted a very um, you know, persuasive case. I thought you know, the defendants really, they didn't have very, my memory, correct me again, they didn't have very many witnesses. They had one or two um, witnesses, somebody on, a, a professor uh, from Serbia. On Nothing Serbia. wrong with that. No. <laughs> no, a professor from Serbia on Serbian law or whatever it was <laughs> like that. Mark, do, you, do you want to jump in and then maybe we have time for a couple okay. more well, questions? I, I remember, <laughs> first of all, in response to your question, Mr. Danforth, there was uh, the events in Srebrenica became so well publicized and so notorious that witness after witness would come in for the defense. And to the simple question that was asked, you know, were people murdered as a result of, you know, at Srebrenica? The answer generally was no. These were simply Srebrenica deniers. Then there was expert testimony. There was a, a, a general Professor Radinovich yes, who, suggested, it. who it suggested, who suggested, it was Andrew, it was Andrew who suggested that <laughs> the French had been responsible <laughs> for the massacres at Srebrenica, and Andrew Cayley who you all know had the cross-examination of Professor General Radinovich and demolished it. I mean, so those are, those are some examples. That's great. Okay, a couple more questions. Maybe, can I take two or three questions and then let the panelists, just so you all have the, the lady right in front and then the gentleman behind her? Yeah. Great question. Okay, and okay, in front of you. Okay, so the questions are: Do we have an accepted definition of genocide? If so, what is it? Is there a definition of crimes against humanity? If so, what is it? In 30 seconds or less, folks. And is any of this being committed in Syria? All right. And there was a question over here in the orange shirt, please. Uh, maybe there's a question tonight, but how come none of these people were executed? Why would they simply give them life sentences? OK, why no executions? Why do we only give life sentences? And one last question. Yes, in the vest. Uh, and I assume by, by most powerful country in the world, you're referring to the United States. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just checking. 
<laughs> Canada, right? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll discover why Canada refuses to be held accountable in a moment. Um, let's turn, I think this question of do we have a clear definition of genocide and crimes against humanity is maybe the, bo the most, uh, the quickest, and then we can turn to the issue of Syria, then the death penalty or not, and then <clears throat> the US most powerful country Georgia. in the country. Okay, maybe just Bill and just jump in. As you see fit. I'm not going to recite the technical yeah. definition, but it was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly uh, and is included in the Genocide Convention dating back to 1948. That's the definition of genocide. The definition of crimes against humanity varies somewhat from tribunal to tribunal. The core of it is found in the Nuremberg uh, Charter uh, that was drafted by Robert Jackson and, and others. The, basically, the distinction is that genocide requires the intentional destruction of a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. It's a racial crime, and it involves physical destruction. This is how it's been interpreted by the courts. Crimes against humanity uh, doesn't require the targeting of a national or an ethnic group. It can, it can cover any civilian population, and it covers a much broader range of atrocities uh, than physical extermination, than physical destruction. So uh, we talk about persecution and other inhumane acts. It's a much broader crime in terms of its, of its nature. Uh, on the executions, I can give a very brief sure, answer yes. on that. Um, I'd like to say that it's because the rest of the world uh, is opposed to the death penalty, uh, but the United States is not the only country that, that has the death penalty. But at the international level, you have to have a common denominator because you have to require states to cooperate in bringing people to justice and contributing to the tribunals. About 160 countries now, out of 190-odd countries, are no longer conducting the death penalty, and many of them would not be able legally to participate in an international tribunal if it had the death penalty. And then finally, the U.S. Well, the U.S. doesn't have any say in this, you know. There are, there are U.S. forces in Afghanistan, which is a party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and they are subject to the International Criminal Court. And the prosecutor, in fact, issued a statement last November about the preliminary examinations that refers to the investigations into torture and ill-treatment being conducted by, under U.S. authority, in camps in Afghanistan. I didn't, there, I'm no doubt that angry words were said in the Department of State, uh, but I didn't hear anything public saying that there was no right to prosecute them. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's clear that U.S. citizens can be prosecuted uh, as long as we've established jurisdiction somewhere else on another basis. And the territory of the Rome Statute, the International Criminal Court, now geographically covers 123 uh, plus two actually because it includes Sudan and, and Libya. But you know, about two thirds of the, of the countries in the world now have subjected their territory to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And if US nationals commit crimes there, they're subject to prosecution. Okay, my, my take would be on the definition. I don't really have any concern, or I mean, I don't have any primary concern with the definition that you've referred to that's in the Genocide Convention. My problem is the way that some courts have interpreted the level of proof that they have required or additional things that they have sort of added on to it. I think the basic definition is a perfectly good definition. It's the way the courts, some courts, have interpreted it to require seemingly that's something over and above what the definition says to me, uh, which is an intent, certain acts, with, done with an intent to destroy a particularly defined group. Uh, so uh, certainly the death penalty, they, these two were, the ICTY is a UN court, UN, um, UN created court. No UN created court ever can have the death penalty. It's one of their principles uh, that they will not allow uh, anything. As far as Syria, or you, you haven't gotten to Syria? No, we haven't gotten to Syria. Okay, as far as the U.S. goes, um, 
I agree with what Bill said, but as far as their refusal to ever uh, let so far U.S. people uh, come before the ICC, even if they would normally be included somehow in the jurisdiction through other countries, I have concern about it. Let me leave it there. Mark? Um, I might just comment, I see Jim Johnson is down. On Syria, more to come. Obviously, many of the crimes committed there, not only by the state, but by organized armed groups and others, could come within the definitions of the crimes we've been talking about. The question is jurisdiction. And right now, alas, we're not in the world of the early 1990s when the Security Council was functioning. We are in a really dysfunctional uh, world in terms of the Security Council. And the only way to get Syria to the International Criminal Court is through the Security Council. Council. That doesn't mean there aren't groups working very, very hard to try to form some other basis for accountability, but that's not something possible uh, yet, yet, in the world that we're in. Please join me in thanking our three amazing panelists on the Jackson Center. Thank you. Thank you very much. A tremendous panel and wonderful questions. Thank you very much. Um, our next session, which will take place in this room, is open only to the students that we have come. We have students from Washington University, Case Western, and the Summer Institute. And this is the chance for the students to have some time with the prosecutors. and. Uh, we're about the young. We've talked about that many times and the education of the youth. And this is a chance for the students to have some time with the prosecutors. So we thank you very, very much. There are buses waiting to go back to the hotel. Uh, the reception, I remind you, is at 6 o'clock and those joining us for dinner at 6.30. And so we will see you all in a little while. And I do remind you as you're walking out the door that tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, is the year in review.